Good evening. Good evening. It's great to be here and it's great to have the opportunity again to be able to come together and be able to worship God and get to study a little bit uh, out of His Word. We've been doing some different series on uh, Sunday nights, uh, looking at different books of the Bible. And we went through 1st, 2nd Timothy, and we went through uh, Philemon, and I thought it would be fitting if we uh, tried to make our way through the Thessalonian letters, 1st uh, and 2nd Thessalonians, uh, written to the church at Thessalonica. Now, these letters are some great, uh, have some great information in them. They deal quite a bit with the end times. They deal quite a bit with a uh, church that is struggling with evangelism in an area where it's not always well received. And there, I think there's a lot we can learn from this series. You may have already noticed that the title for this evening's lesson is Convictions of the Spirit. And the text is 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, the first 10 verses. If you want to be going ahead and uh, turning over there, I'll explain the title a little bit and kind of set the background for uh, what, what we'll be talking about tonight in a little more detail. Thessalonica was a city that was very special to Rome. Um, it was in, in the Ignatian way, a big highway that Rome had built, and there was a lot of travel that had come through here. You had to go Thessalonica really to begin the Ignatian way. It was really at the uh, midway to get to the east, eastern part of the Roman Empire. So it was a very important city. It saw a lot of people. It saw a lot of commerce. It was a, a, a big area for commerce and travel. Thessalonica, being a, a major city in uh, the Roman uh, colonies and in, in Rome itself, it also got quite a bit of attention from Paul. When Paul was traveling through there, uh, Paul visited there and could set up uh, a group of Christians worshiping and acting like Christ and doing uh, the work of the church there. And they accomplished quite a bit. In fact, as we're going to read tonight, uh, their faith and their actions and their love and their, and their hope that they were holding on to didn't just sound forth in their own area, but it affected the surrounding areas. Um, it was going throughout the world. People heard about the church in Thessalonica. To set the stage a little bit for our title and what this is really talking about, one thing we may not always remember to do is to put the letter we're reading in the time it was written. You see, this letter was written to Thessalonica during a time that we are not accustomed to. It was a time that when you went to read Scripture, you had not a, what we're holding in our hands. There might have been a couple of scrolls pleasant, present in the, in the town uh, from the Old Testament. They usually had a copy of the Old Testament there. Um, but we did not have a written New Testament. In fact, the very letter that we're going to begin studying tonight would have just been sent to them. And perhaps that was close to all they had had besides people coming in person and teaching. And during this time in church history, uh, you had something going on that was wonderful. That was amazing. Amazing might be the best way to describe it. Since there was no written word to guide and direct the young churches that were trying to live like the church of God, that were trying to live under this new covenant that was bought with Christ's blood, they did, since they did not have any written word to really go by, these gifts were bestowed upon them to help them spread the gospel, to help them have the knowledge and understanding they needed, the prophecy so that they would have the spoken word even when they did not have the written word. They lived in an age of miracles, in an age of great works, wonders being done. Things to prove the messenger and the message that he was bringing. Things to, to prove that the words that were being said were of God and not just something that man had concocted. In fact, if you'll read through the, Paul's letter to Galatia, the church in Galatia, in Galatians chapter 1 and verse 9, Paul brings out that if anyone comes with a different message other than the one that we brought, he alludes later to that they brought it with the spirit and power, alluding back to these miraculous gifts. If anyone else tries to preach some other gospel, let them be accursed. That word really carries a lot of weight. The word's anathema, and it means to be cut off from Israel, to cut off from society, to be cut off from the group, to not just remove them, but to separate them to where they cannot be a part anymore. 
that they're forbidden to even be around. Well, at this time, these miracles were being done. These people were so convicted in their hearts of the truth by all the wonders being done around them. It wouldn't have been that difficult in our eyes, looking now back on things, it wouldn't have been that difficult for someone to believe that someone was speaking the truth if when they came to town, they brought someone back from the dead. They healed someone that had been lame for years, caused the blind to see again. Those that we had known and grown up around who were deaf could suddenly hear. Those who were laying on their deathbed, sick with an illness, suddenly were well. It wouldn't be that hard for us to assume they were telling the truth. But we're not at that time. We weren't there. And many of them did not believe, even when they saw. They, they had been accustomed to prophets coming before. They had the law and the prophets to guide them, much like we have the scriptures to guide us today. These people lived at a time when seeing things like this is what caused them to have the faith they had. Caused them to love so fully and to trust so earnestly in the hope that they were expecting. Read along with me, if you will, 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. We're going to read through the first ten verses. If you will there, follow along with me. Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy, to the church of the Thessalonians, in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace. We give thanks to God always for all of you, constantly mentioning you in our prayers, remembering before God, our Father and Father, your work of faith and labor of love and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. For we know, brothers loved by God, that He has chosen you, because our gospel came to you not only in word, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction. You know what kind of men we proved to be among you for your sake, and you became imitators of us and of the Lord. For you received the word in much affliction, with the joy of the Holy Spirit, so that you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. For not only has the word of the Lord sounded forth from you in Macedonia and Achaia, but your faith in God has gone forth everywhere, so that we need not say anything. For they themselves report concerning us to the kind of reception we had among you, and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God, and to wait for His Son from heaven, whom He raised from the dead, Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. Thank you for following along in that with me. As I mentioned before, you may have noticed that that might be quite different. In fact, it, it most likely is quite different from the conversion experience you experience whenever you uh, came to the gospel. Perhaps you were raised around Christianity. Perhaps you were not. But they lived in a very different time. Many of these people came out of idolatry, believing in gods of wood or stone or other elements. They came out of a system that had been organized by man, where they had never seen real power. And then here this real power came. This evening, I want us to focus on three things that the church of Thessalonica did because of this conviction they had. First, their work of faith. The work of faith. Second, their labor of love. And finally, their steadfastness of hope. Now, these words that we, these phrases that we read in the text as we were going over it, the work of faith, the labor of love, the steadfastness of hope, may have not have carried a lot of depth and meaning. Uh, may, may have just seemed like another list to you as we were going over them. But I want us to spend a little more time with each one so that we can really understand. Um, not only how that was applicable to the church of Thessalonica and how is it exhibited in their lives, but also what that would have to do with us today as Christians. First, this work of faith idea. Many of us, I'm sure, are aware of what faith is. Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 1 gives us a pretty good definition of faith. Faith is assurance. Faith is the substance of things hope for us. It's assurance of the things that we don't see. The evidence of what's not right in front of us 
giving us full conviction that it really does exist. But work of faith, now that'll go a little step further. Working in faith. You see, faith in of itself is nothing. It's pointless. James points this out. That people were, were depending on the fact that they believed. That they had faith in what they did not see right in front of them. And that was just good enough for them. He points out that even the demons believe. Believing, having faith, that doesn't win us any, any brownie points. It doesn't gain us any ground. Faith, if not acted upon, is nothing. Faith without some kind of work is, is dead. It's empty. It's hollow. It's meaningless. In Romans chapter 6 and verse 17, Paul is laying out a, a structured theological argument for salvation. One to show how man is in sin and has a condition that needs to be rectified. And that how God provides that solution through faith. And how that faith is worked out. And in Romans 6.17, he says, Thanks be to God that you who were once slaves of sin have been become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed. What he's describing here in Romans chapter 6, that standard, uh, that standard of teaching, that type of doctrine, is baptism. If you read the beginning of chapter 6, he says it describes how baptism is like the death burial and resurrection of Jesus. We'll find that beginning of chapter 6. You see, when Paul is describing the gospel, and says over and over again the gospel, the gospel, the gospel, in Romans chapter 1 and verse 16 when he says, For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it's the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. What is he talking about? Gospel. Is he talking about all of Scripture? Well, that, that wouldn't make any sense. He told Timothy that Scripture is breathed out by God. That's Profitable for proof and correction, for training in righteousness, to thoroughly equip the man of God for every good work. But that, that isn't in the same realm, isn't the same idea. You see, Romans chapter 1, Paul said that he was eager to preach the gospel to them that were in Rome, that he wasn't ashamed of the gospel, that it was the power of God. Well, to the church of Corinth, he tells us exactly what that gospel was. He said, I delivered what I had also received. Jesus died, was buried, rose from the dead, and then he lists the appearances of Christ. That's often called the kirigam. That's a, a word to describe a, a teaching that was passed down. If you look at the structure in the original language, it's actually structured as something that would have been memorized and repeated. The Jews were famous for this. The majority of the teaching and education they had was oral. They remember, remembered things and passed it down. What was this gospel? Why was it so important? What was obeying the gospel? It's one thing to believe in God's power to save. It's one thing to believe that Jesus died, was buried, was resurrected. But to take a step out in faith. We have a baptistry over here behind me. Where when somebody decides they want to obey the gospel. We take them down into the water and we bury them. In that water and we rise them up. Raise them up out of the water to live a new life. But that water has no special properties. It's been quite wet outside. It might be kind of cold, but I'm sure we could find a ditch or a creek with enough water to lay someone down and completely cover them, and it would accomplish the same thing. I'm sure many of us have a, a bathtub at home. Some of us may have a swimming pool. That water could accomplish the same thing. We could go out to Wilhelmina and accomplish the same thing. If we really want to drive, we could imagine we could drive all the way to the Mississippi, accomplish the same thing. It's not the water. It's not the location of the water. People flock to Israel because they want to be baptized in the Jordan River, the very same place that Jesus was. And I, I can see the sentimental value in that because it's so interesting to walk in the place that Jesus would go. I'd love to take a trip there myself. But it, there's nothing about the place the water is in. There's nothing about the location, the color. 
It's an act of faith. Peter said, in the same way that Noah, the eight souls, Noah's family, were saved by water, baptism corresponds to that, which now saves us. <coughs> baptism is an appeal to God for a clear conscience. It's not the act of baptism that he's talking about in chapter 3. It's not the, the physical act of being underwater. It's obedience. And then that's what he said to do. He could have said that he wanted us to jump off the top of a roof of a tall building and land on a trampoline. That's not what he chose. But that could have been the act of obedience. With Abraham, the act of obedience was being circumcised. Which in our culture has become something of a, of a cultural norm. But can you imagine being the first person ever being told to do that? That might be somewhat shocking of a request. It wasn't about the individual action. It's what it represented. The power of the gospel does not reside in baptism. It resides in the gospel. And the fact that Jesus died. The fact that he was raised from the dead and he's sitting right now in heaven at the right hand of God, providing us salvation through that. The power of baptism lies in that. That was their work of faith through obedience. Something they not only did then, but they continued on obeying out of faith. But it doesn't just stop there. They shared their faith. The work of faith they were doing wasn't just in that initial belief and response to that. One that doesn't just stop there. Paul said, I die daily. And that was an action that he completed every day, dying daily. Offering up himself as a sacrifice. Daily is the way he wrote he worded in Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. He presented his life as a living sacrifice. One that wasn't just sacrificed once and done, but every day was refreshed anew. The church at Thessalonica shared their faith. Quite a commendation to have from Paul. He did not have to go to someone and say, you should hear about the church at Thessalonica and all that they're doing. He would go somewhere and they would tell him about the church at Thessalonica. Paul would go to a new place, a new town, and say, have you heard about the church in Thessalonica? We heard about the great work you did there. How they turned away from idolatry. How they're sharing, they're sharing their faith. Paul, when he was writing to Philemon, in verse 6 of that letter, says, And I pray that the sharing of your faith may become effective for the full knowledge of every good thing that is in us for the sake of Christ. Now, there's a greater context here that's very important in the Philemon letter. But did you notice what Philemon was doing with his faith? He wasn't keeping it in. He was sharing it. And that's what Paul was praying for. That that faith would continue to be shared. That that's what he would do. That he didn't want him to hide it. Leave it in the corner at home. He didn't want it to leave it sitting in a pew at a church building. He didn't want to, to leave it at the prayer meeting. He wanted him to take it out with him and share it. Now, this work of faith is very important. But it would mean nothing if that's all that it was. The church of Thessalonica did not just have work and faith. But they labored in love. And that's another thing that Paul mentioned just in these first ten verses to the church of Thessalonica. That their labor of love. They labored out of love because they were loved. When Paul was writing to the church at Ephesus and uh, possibly even the surrounding areas, there's a lot to a lot, many say that this was a circular letter. Some of the earliest manuscripts doesn't have the word Ephesus at the front of it. It seems like a lot of the letters Paul wrote he wanted to be circulated in churches in the area. But this letter to the church in Ephesus, he says in, in chapter 5, verse 1 and 2, Therefore be imitators of God as beloved children. So they're beloved children. He said, And walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us. A fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Walk in love because you're loved. The way that you're loved. The labor of love that we have, that Thessalonica 
labor of love that we should have, needs to be a reflection of God's love out of us, showing through us to everyone around us. Something that is evident the moment somebody sees us. Their labor of love was one that wasn't stagnant, wasn't one that said idle. It worked. Their love worked. In John 14 and verse 15, John, or Jesus said something, a very popular uh, phrase that he said, and this was actually uh, in one of his final speeches, uh, talks with his disciples. He said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Now in this greater context, he's talking about what it will be like after he leaves. What they'll be left to do. But notice this little snippet. If you love me, you ever had anybody tell you, I just love Jesus? Well, you need to do this and this and Well, I just need to love Jesus. And I love that Jesus triumphs everybody. Jesus said, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. There's another way this applies. If you're not doing things, if you're not laboring, do you really love Jesus? Do you really love God? If you're not sharing that love, if you're not shining out that same love that He has for you, if you're not shining that out to others, do you, do you really love God? It's, an, it's a worthy question to ask. The church of Thessalonica, their love shone all around them. The people not only in their area, but around the world were hearing of their love, of their faith, and of their hope. And a hope that wasn't just any kind of hope, one that was steadfast. It's easy to hope in something for a little while. What's hard is keeping up with it. They left idolatry. They left what they had known for their entire lives to be true. Not to enter another flavor of it. This isn't the same thing as someone that leaves one denomination to join the other. The equivalent would be someone leaving Buddhism for Christianity. Someone who's leaving Hinduism for Christianity. Someone who's in some entirely different religion, with an entirely different set of beliefs, with an entirely different idea of God or gods, leaving all that to become a Christian. Paul, when writing to the church of Corinth, who also had to deal with leaving idolatry, as many of the, much of the world did at that time, he said, therefore, 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 4, therefore, as to the eating of food offered to idols, we know that an idol has no real existence. That there is no God but one. Now take a snippet of this. The greater context is him talking about um, eating food that had been offered to idols in the temple, buying that food, taking it home and eating it. And those that believed in these idols were real and were coming out of this, they had no problem. Because in their mind, they're still stuck on this fact that this is something they've seen as a God for their entire life. And it's taking them a while to come out of that and it's becoming a stumbling block for them. Something that they still haven't got their mind around. But do you notice how nonchalantly Paul says this? We know that they're not real gods. We know they don't really have any existence. But how much does that take to come from knowing in your heart that there are multiple gods? Knowing in your heart that this is one God or another God or a different God. To turn to the one true God. And to hold fast to it. How much temptation would there be to go back to what you had grown up hearing and believing? Their hope was steadfast. Even in spite of their conversion. Not just specifically themselves and their conversion. But going further than that, they were waiting on Jesus. Many had the idea that Jesus would be back in a week, a month, a year. We're not told exact time frames, but they were expecting it to be soon. Some believed that John would not die before Jesus came back again. But that's not quite what Jesus had said. He said if he came back before he was to die. 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 26, when doing an excursus on uh, specifically the Lord's Supper, uh, Terry read a little bit out of this this 
morning you know, when we were partaking of the Lord's Supper and communion. The purpose of the Lord's Supper is to remember Christ's death. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until He comes. 1 Corinthians 11, 26. This action <coughs> was one that remembered, refreshed anew the sacrifice that Christ has made. That's why we take it. It's not because unleavened bread and grape juice is good for our bodies and we need that constant nourishment. It's not the physical aspects. That is what's represented. Similarly in baptism. But you notice the hope that's connected on doing that? You keep doing this until He comes. You keep doing this in view of His coming, knowing that you're remembering that sacrifice He made. I want to leave us with a question tonight. Are you fully convinced? In your heart, are you fully convinced to the point where you are ready to step out in faith. <coughs> we are ready to let your love shine out. The very love that God has for you. Where you're going to remain steadfast in your hope. Continuing on. Are you fully convinced? If not, then something needs to change. If you're not stepping out in faith, and sharing that faith, if you're not loving Reflecting that same love that God has for you. If you're not living on with hope, remembering the Lord's death till He comes, looking forward to His return, become fully convinced tonight. Become completely sure and let it change your life. If you'd like to make a decision, won't you come right now? Once again, let's stand and sing.